All right, so we are going to reconvene this meeting. Um, we'll start with our land acknowledgement. We recognize that the Mount Diablo Unified School District sits on the territory of the Confederated Villages of the Lashon, the ancestral and unceded land of the Bay Miwok in Northern Yokut, the successors of the sovereign Verona Band of Contra Costa, Contra Costa County. As members of the MDUSD community, it is vitally important that we not only recognize the history of the land on which we learn, but also we recognize that the land we inhabit and learn on is the ancestral land of these people who are alive and flourishing members of MDUSD and broader Bay Area communities today. Madam President, as we um, open the meeting, can we open it in memory of Farah Marcello, um, passed away long time, you know, Show Valley High School teacher? Yes, yes, of course. Thank All you right. so much. You may stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so that moves us to 6.3, um, review and potential um, approval of minutes for regular board meeting held March 6, 2024. Madam Chair, I move to approve the minutes for the regular board meeting held March 6, 2024. Second. Okay, thank you. That's a motion from Trustee Mason, the second from Trustee Mayo. And that motion passes 5-0. That moves us to um, 6.4, review and potential approval of the agenda. Um, are there gonna be any changes? No changes, Madam President. Madam President, I move the board approve the agenda as presented. I'll second that. Okay, thank you. That's a motion by Trustee Mayo and a second by Trustee Mason. And that motion passes 5-0. So that moves us to to I'm um, sorry to the report out of action taken in closed session for 7.1 negotiations the board may discuss negotiations or provide directions uh, to its representatives regarding represented employees pursuant to government code section 549 um, 57.6 the board received information for 7.2 discipline dismissal release or reassignment of public employee government code section 54957b1 in a um in closed session by a vote of five to zero, the board took action to approve the resignation of employee ID number 46950 per agreement. Um, that was that was unanimous. Um, and then for, for sorry, um, for 7.3 student record appeal pursuant to California Education Code, 49070 student identification um, 01-24. The board voted to deny the student record appeal pursuant to California Code uh, Education Code section 49070. Um, the motion um, carried by um, four votes, trustees Mason, Mayo, Count, and McFerrin with one recusal by trustee and say we. All right. Um, for 7.4, um, liability claims government so code section 54956.95, name of claimant, Deborah Hollinger. Um, the um, name of agency against um, the claim is made, which is um, the Mount Diablo Unified School District. Um, the board voted unanimously. The board found the claim was not presented in a timely manner, and it is returned untimely. For 7.5, Liability Claims Government Code Section 54956.95, name of claimant, Gain Tian. Um, the name of the agency which the claim is made, Mount Diablo Unified School District. Um, the board voted unanimously, and the board instructed staff to send a notice of rejection. Um, and so that moves us to um, public comment. Um, do we have public comment this evening?
Okay, so it looks like we'll start with, um, so public comment um, to the board, or sorry, the public may address the board regarding any item not on the agenda. Public comment will also be allowed on each specific agenda item prior to board action thereon. We usually provide about three minutes for each comment, and so we will be doing that this evening. And our first speaker this evening is Angel Bazan Malera. Oh, can you hear me? <laughs> so good evening, everyone, members of the board, Superintendent Mr. Clark. It's an honor to be back here. I know it's been a long time since you last saw me. I know it's been a while since the last board meeting since you last, since I last spoke. So I wanted to come and address some good news uh, regarding uh, the process of, as you probably noticed, that I'm in the process of getting a guide dog from Guide Dogs for the Blind. Let me give you a little bit of a backstory about this organization. Guide Dogs for the Blind is a nonprofit organization that trains uh, dogs to become service and to become extremely, extremely trainable guide dogs. We also we we have um, three um, programs that GDB that GDB um, offers. We have our orientation and mobility immersion program, which uh, and we also have our Canine Buddy program that we also include um, people who are five years old and above. That are that are matched with dogs who are who have the potential to become buddies. In the process, and um, we also have our guide dog program, which in, which is a two week uh, residential or in home training program. These include our clients will be matched with uh, with with the dog that will best fit their needs, and we have three breed three dogs that we that we breed at GDB. First, we have our Golden Retrievers, we have Labrador Golden Cross, and we have Labrador Retrievers. And we also provide um, no government funding, regardless of any, any of our services are required and completely free, free of charge. And also, um, we wanted to, you know, bring this up to you guys and hopefully, um, especially we wanted to make, make, you know, people who are blind and visually impaired heard. As a member of the blind and visually impaired community, you know, I grew up in Southern California. As you probably know that I grew up in <laughs> Orange County and I've been around people who are blind and visually impaired probably since I can remember. So I just wanted to bring this, you know, um, you know, item up for you guys. And hopefully once I get my guide dog, you know, I've been, we can have a little like, you know, welcome to MVUSD ceremony and to welcome her into our district someday. So I just want to give you guys a quick update. And I wanted to congratulate all of you guys for being and in, being involved. And I want and I want to thank all of you for supporting me in, in this process. I know it's been a long time. So I just wanted to say thank you to every one of you who has been very supportive to me the last couple of weeks in this process with my guide dog. So can't wait to finally come the day when the when I get a chance to bring my guide dog in for to, you know, to welcome him or her into our district. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Angel. Laura Powell. Hi, I'm Laura Powell. I'm a mother. I'm also a lawyer. I'm here to talk about the fifth grade sexual education program. Uh, it's ironic that the district chose a curriculum that's called the three R's, because as we know, sadly, most kids in this district are not learning the three R's and they're below grade level. There's no requirement to do fifth grade sex ed at all, much less to spend around 10 hours of classroom time on the subject. And, you know, it's the prerogative of the district to do this, to prioritize sex ed over academics. However, you still have to follow state law and the board's own policies. The district has been misleading parents about their right to opt out of the program. The letter we received at our school was full of false information. Last night, we got a letter that almost complies with the law, but this is way too late. This was required at the beginning of the school year. 
not on the cusp of starting the program, we still have not been allowed to access all of the materials in the program. And finally, there's issues with the content. The state law sets out some requirements, what you can and cannot include, and board policy requires that the curriculum align with the state standards. Reviewing the materials that are available to me, I found information that's medically inaccurate, that's sexist, that's negative, and most importantly, that is age inappropriate. And this isn't just my opinion. For example, there is the topics of sexual pleasure and sexual attraction are covered in this curriculum. That's not in the state standards until you reach the upper grades because it's not age appropriate for young children. The reason you're not hearing from more parents on this topic is for one, they don't know what's going on. And two, they're afraid to speak up. I've had parents tell me that. They're gonna get called names if they come and talk about a topic like this. But this issue is not about politics or discrimination or hating anybody. Parents have not just a right, but a duty to raise their children in accordance with their own values and schools should not be standing in their way. How are parents supposed to trust you when you have dealt with this sensitive topic in a deceitful way, have not been upfront about what the materials are, what the parents' rights are? Please just focus on your job, which is teaching the actual three Rs and stop treating parents like we can't be trusted to do our job, which is raising our children. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Powell. Okay, so that moves us to um, communications. Um, no, okay. Um, so that moves us to rec uh, recogni recognitions and resolutions. Um, Dr. Clark? So tonight we are uh, very excited to uh, recognize some very uh, special people. Every year the district participates in the, um, in the annual um, Teacher of the Year um, um, uh, process. And, um, and every year we just get a plethora of, of extremely fine educators um, and we look for them to represent Mount Diablo in the, um, in the county uh, and then also um, if if they um, you know submit an application, do the do the visits and whatnot, they may have an opportunity to be represented at the state. And so, um, so we have five individuals who I'm going to recognize this evening. The first three are the um, are the runner-up finalists, and then um, I will do the last two, who are two teachers of the year. So, um, so with that, the first um, first person we're going to recognize is. Uh, Michelle Housie. Is Michelle in the house? Could we... All right. <laughs> All right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a little bit about you. Is that okay? All right. All right. So Michelle began teaching in MDUSD in 2007, and she has been teaching for 16 years. She started as a student teacher at Silverwood in a fourth grade class and then moved to Meadow Homes for two years before being laid off. She worked as a substitute at Clayton Valley High School and came to realize how much she missed working with elementary students. Fortunately, Michelle returned to elementary at Bel Air um, Elementary School and then Ignacio Valley Elementary School before arriving to Mount Diablo Elementary, where she has been for nine years and is currently teaching third grade. Michelle loves her students and comes to work each day to make a positive impact on each student. She loves creating special learning opportunities and moments that remain with students long after the classroom. Michelle has spent the past 17 years dedicating her life to the youth in her community and has coached cross country and track at Clayton Valley High School and was the camp director for Lafayette location Camp Gallego. So could we please give another big round of applause for Michelle Housie.
And Ms. Halsey, I would like to, you don't have to say a speech, but will you at least introduce the people who are, are here supporting you, your family, and we'd like to. Yes, I thank you very much. That was very, it was an honor to um, be a, a finalist for this award. So thank you. Um, I just, I brought my family with me. Uh, my parents are here, Bob and Roxana, and my sister Kelly, mm -hmm. and my niece and nephew, Aiden and Charlotte, my boyfriend, Ryan, and his daughter, Audrina. They're all here. We are, many of us are, or my sister and I are also um, students of Mount Diablo Unified also. So we did Mountain View, Diablo View when it first opened, and she did Pine Hollow and then Clayton Valley. So. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And our next teacher that I would like to acknowledge is Angela Beatty. Is Angela here? Okay. <laughs> Angela. All right. Angela, is it okay if I read a little bit about you? All right. <laughs> Angela's love of teaching began early when she worked as a kickboxing instructor while still in high school. While attending UC Santa Cruz, Angela worked as a one-on-one -on -one aide for students with special needs. After graduating college, Angela worked at Seneca Center as a mental health counselor, working with middle school students with, diverse, with a diverse range of academic, social, emotional, and behavioral needs. She went and, re and returned to school to get her multiple subject credential in order to work with younger children. She first taught first grade in Oakland. For the next eight years, she taught at Shore Acres Elementary and has been at Westwood Elementary for the past two years. Angela believes that making a positive impact on students' daily lives is the best part about teaching. And she strives to create a classroom her students look forward to coming to and feeling empowered. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Angela B. Can you just can you come in and support your uh, or introduce your support system? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. It is definitely an honor to be here. Yeah. Um, I brought my husband Zach Beatty and my two children, Benjamin and Abigail Beatty. Um, they go to the school that I teach at now, oh. <laughs> kindergarten and second grade. And then my mother-in-law, Ellen Beatty Lundy, and a colleague of mine came to support me, Virginia Alexany in fourth grade at Westwood. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Our, our third and, and, and um, final um, finalist runner left. I'm not sure if she's here. Lizette Ortega Dolan. Okay. Yeah, I have absent down here, but we're going to read about her. Want to hear about her? All right. Let's hear about Lizette. Lizette has 25 years of teaching experience. She cannot imagine being anything other than an educator. Believing that education has the power to change lives, she strove to be the teacher to students and families that she never had. Her experiences as a student and young teacher of color shaped her advocacy for equity in all aspects of life. Lizette currently teaches English at Pine Hollow Middle School, where she continues to support schools and nonprofits with institutional strategic initiatives. Over the course of her career, Lizette has successfully collaborated with organizations to ensure sustainable and meaningful learning spaces striving to serve schools and graduate and graduating young people that emerge as confident and compassionate and to be positive agents of change. Ladies and gentlemen, I present Lizette Ortega Dolan. Where's uh, Teresa? We doing pictures, Teresa? Yeah, we'll, yeah. All right, we'll do all five and then we'll do some pictures, all right? All right. All right, so uh, we have we have two teachers of the year and um, we are extremely proud of, of course, of all of our employees, but um, these two went through a, a rigorous process and were chosen by their peers and also uh, folks down here at the district office and beyond. But um, the first teacher of the year that I would like to announce is Mia Corella. Is Mia here? Okay. <laughs> there she is. There she is. <laughs> I recognize her picture from all the all the photos on the website. So all right. So can I can I embarrass you a little bit? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mia has been teaching for 11 years 
and has been teaching at Walnut Acres Elementary for eight years. Mia grew up in Walnut Creek, attended Walnut Acres herself, and is delighted to continue the legacy of teachers who inspired her. Mia knew she would be a teacher from early on, and after graduating from high school at Northgate, she attended Cal Poly, where she got a BS in child development. She first started teaching at a Title I school in San Rafael, where she really developed her love of working with younger students. Mia feels she is her most comfortable and most authentic self with, while teaching. After moving back to Walnut Creek and was thrilled to get a job at Walnut Acres. Outside of teaching, Mia spends as much time as possible with her friends and family. She loves to run, travel, and do anything creative. Ladies and gentlemen, Mia Corella. Well, you, well, you come on up and, and introduce your support system there and share anything that you like to. The... <laughs> Yeah. Thank you so much. This is a big honor to be here. And uh, with me is my parents and my sister and uh, my amazing co-workers and principal. Uh, oh. And thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Our next teacher of the year. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please help me um, welcome Ingrid Wright. It was Ingrid. Okay. I see her back there. She is. All right. Ingrid comes from a... Oh, Ingrid, can I embarrass you a little bit? <laughs> okay, good. I just want to make sure. Teachers are extremely modest and they really hate to be talked about. So I want to make sure. Ingrid comes from a family of MDUSD educators, is a graduate of Northgate High School, and has been teaching for 27 years herself. Ingrid started her career in 1997 at Pleasant Hill Elementary teaching kindergarten, third and fourth grades before moving to Monte Gardens where she job shared for the next 11 years. Ingrid currently teaches fourth grade at Bancroft Elementary. Ingrid encourages her students to believe in themselves and have a growth mindset to achieve. She enjoys working with and motivating all students to do their personal best. One of her greatest joys is cheering on and encouraging students to never give up, then to watch those students achieve what they thought they couldn't do. Ingrid feels teaching is a craft that you can spend a lifetime developing and says it has been personally very rewarding to help students become lifelong learners. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Ingrid Wright. Thank you, Dr. Clark. Thank you, board. It's an honor and a privilege to represent so many amazing teachers in the school district. Um, I'm humbled and honored. And I brought my husband, David Wright, my daughter, Lily Wright, my mom, Karen Stoker, who taught in the district for 35 years. Oh. And my sister, Meredith Trutnich. And my boss, Cindy Dunn. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. We have pictures and we have class.
My, he's working my brother. He's, we're four years apart, but we, we, Victoria, do you want to assemble your group as I read the uh, resolution? You guys are next up. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Good. You should stand there as I start. I'm going to start and we have a... Okay. Yeah. All right, Madam President, that was, um, that was an info item Info only item 10.1. This is item 10.2, review and potential approval of resolution 23-24-57 in support of K-12 adult education. So whereas the first recorded adult education class in California was held in the basement of St. Mary's Cathedral in San Francisco in 1856, the class was authorized by the San Francisco Board of Education to teach English to Irish, Italian, and Chinese immigrants. John Sweat, who was the first volunteer teacher for the class, later became a state superintendent of public instruction. I didn't know that. Um, whereas over 66% of adult learners enrolled in adult education across California in 2022-23 were between the ages of 25 and 54, many with children in our California public school systems. The impact of adult education is felt across generations, particularly for early childhood learners who have been characterized as a priority population to be served by California initiatives by the governor and, legislat and legislature. And whereas, Mount Diablo Adult Education successfully serves Concord and the surrounding communities through its collaboration with its community college and community-based organization partners through the adult education system. Mount Diablo, educate, Mount Diablo Adult Education served 5,794 adult learners in the 2022-23 school year of the national and state recovery from impacts of COVID. So whereas the Mount, Diablo unit, the Mount Diablo Adult Education provides a safe environment for its students, free from discrimination or bullying, and regardless of race, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, or socioeconomic status. So now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Trustees of the Mount Diablo Unified School District strongly urges the governor of California Gavin Newsom and the California legislature to, uh, legislature to recognize the, 
important role of K-12 adult education in addressing the needs of California communities, increasing access to programs and services for the most in need adult learners of our great state. Madam President, I now leave this very distinguished resolution in the hands of the board. Madam President, I move to approve resolution 23-24-57 in support of California Adult Education Week, April 7th through April 13th, 2024. Second. It's a motion from Trustee Mason and a second from Trustee Mayo. And that, that, that motion passes 5-0. Tori, would you like to say a few words and maybe introduce your, your guests here? Thank you very much, Dr. Clark, the board, and to the community. We appreciate the recognition, the acknowledgement of the service of adult education in our community. Uh, the beauty of K-12 adult ed is that we are part of the school district. So we serve all the families in the district. Uh, adults 18 and above, and we are very proud to be connected and supported in working with our colleagues in the K-12 side of the house. And tonight, uh, we have a few of our students who have come that we would like to be uh, introduced to you. Uh, we have tonight, um, did our dental students, I think we had a couple of our dental students leave, they had to leave, but we have our EMT uh, I'd like to just share uh, briefly about this program. Our EMT program is a long-standing program in our adult education programs. But uh, like many positions or jobs, this is an entry-level position. So we have been, for a number of years now in California statewide, working on career pathways, just as we are on the K-12 side, working with pathways for our students to come to career technical education in adult ed, community college, directly into jobs. And so we have um, established a relationship, uh, a longtime relationship. I sit on the Workforce Development Board of Contra Costa County, and we have partnered with the board to support our EMT program. So what that means is we have opened up to our EMT program a wealth of resources both financial and in terms of expertise. Financial in terms of stipends, in terms of support. We have a new articulation agreement with Contra Costa College for their paramedic program. AMR, who is our county service, EMS County Service, uh, is hiring many of our EMTs. They are on a pathway with support at the job also to continue into paramedic, which as we know, fire particularly and police uh, hire paramedics. So they have a, a plethora of opportunities for management, job um, promotion and pathways to college, et cetera. So this is the group, one of our cohorts, we've had a uh, four, four four cohorts now, we're on five and six coming up. Uh, and we are very proud of them. They work very hard. And I would like them to ask if you wouldn't mind, just give your name and uh, we know you're in the EMT program and we have a special guest tonight also. And I have a couple of teachers here. So if you please, uh, if you like, you can, so everyone can hear, that'd be great. Hi. Uh, my name is Jana Mosley. I'm 25 and I just graduated from the EMT evening class at Mount Diablo Adult Education. I'm at the very beginning of the onboarding process with AMR and I'm excited to get started. Thank you. Good evening board. Uh, my name is Christian White. I'm 21 years old and uh, I entered the EMT class um, after a little bit of tragedy. Uh, my grandfather, he passed away uh, last year. And uh, it really stuck, struck a chord in myself. And uh, I wanted to get my life on track. So I wanted to become a firefighter, but this was the first step towards that. Um, I wanted to go to LMC, but their classes was all booked up. So this was the last resort. And my, might I say it was a great last resort because it opened me to uh, many different possibilities and uh, 
just great people to meet and it was it was just a great time to be in there and uh i was i was a part of the night class with jana as well and she's one of the best uh students to be in that class so thank you hi board how are we doing i'm very bad at public speaking i'll just let you know yeah Man, all right. So, my name my name is Ryan, but friends call me writer. Um, I'm 24 years old, and um, I went into this program honestly. Um, I tried to get into nursing school. Uh, they didn't let me in. My alternative was EMT because I needed to get a job. I'm the son of a single mother, so it's kind of hard, you know, trying to balance finances and trying to get your life together. Uh, thanks to this amazing program, I finally got my EMT license. And hopefully we'll be working soon with you guys. Um, I'm really thankful that you gave me the opportunity to be in this program. It's actually feels like such a privilege. I'm very happy to be in it. But that's it. Good evening, board. Um, my name is Joycelyn Jallarina, and um, I'm, I guess, 49. <laughs> um, soon to be 50, but um, I am... Um, I just recently graduated with the um, with um, the same um, previous classmates um, in February and uh, recently passed an REMT, so I haven't started the application process yet for um, employment, but I um, came to the um, EMT program um, after being laid off um, last um, year. And um, I was previously in healthcare for many years and took a different path. Um, so this was like the perfect opportunity for me to redirect back into healthcare. Um, and I'm looking forward to um, other opportunities um, that will arise from this program. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Good evening. My name is Mike Kelsey. Um, I'm from the previous cohort or maybe two cohorts ago. So January 23, I went into the EMT program. Um, I'm 38. I worked in healthcare for 15 years in non-patient care roles. Decided to go learn a little bit about taking care of people. So uh, I went to the Mount Diablo program and I found it to be very, very good. Um, the program director, Gary Juicy, is excellent. The uh, main instructor, Troy Hess, is also excellent. And it prepared me to get a job with um, AMR, who's the 911 service provider here. I'm actually going to work tonight right after this. So um, I highly recommend the program. If anyone's interested, please check it out. And if I just may say quickly, Jocelyn spoke at the commencement. It was wonderful. And they all have great opportunities. Uh, and Los Medanos, you know, we work regionally and they have just closed, we hope temporarily, their, their program because of accreditation things they're working on. And so we have students there. So that's how we collaborate regionally. I just wanted to make sure people understood that we do this across the county and many of these students will be serving in Concord proper, but of course across Contra Costa County. And then last, but as they say, not least, I'd like to introduce Judy Schieber. Judy, raise your hand, say hello. Judy is our program coordinator for ESL, family literacy and citizenship prep. And we are bursting at the seams uh, looking for more space to accommodate all the newcomers to our community. And does, she does a wonderful job. So thank you for coming. And uh, one of our new administrators, Maureen Campbell, vice principal, she is working directly uh, across, they work across all programs, but uh, she also oversees the adults with disabilities and the uh, high school program. So you saw some of the PowerPoint. Those are our programs we have out for you catalogs. Our fact sheet, it has 2223 data because that's that. Yes, it actually is. It has. It's our, always the recruiting. Always recruit. It's our 2223 data because that's the last official data that has the state has approved. So thank you very much, Dr. Clark. Thank you, board, and to the community. And thank you, staff and students. We appreciate you all coming out. Congratulations.
while I hope not to meet one of you in an accident yeah. scene or in an emergency vehicle, I applaud your uh, work with our Mount Diablo adult education. And I will share when I go to my own doctor's office that some of the staff members there have graduated from our Mount Diablo programs and are excellent representatives for our district with the public. So we should be very proud of what Mount Diablo Adult Education offers to our entire community. So thank you. Thank you. So Madam President, our next item is um, item 10.3. Now I have to, um, usually when we, have, when we have young people come to board meetings, I always push them up on the agenda, but since there's no school tomorrow, um, and it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a, now the parents may not, you know, the parents may not be thrilled, but uh, because it's kind of like Friday night on a Wednesday, and we're about to go on spring break. We're letting you guys stay out a little later tonight. But um, Madam President, um, we have item 11.1, um, and we are going to have a dynamic presentation around our international baccalaureate um, programs. And Oh, I'm sorry. Gosh, they killed it. All right. One second. I'm sorry. Can we rewind? I have another resolution. <laughs> I was so excited. I see the, the young people, my guy all dressed up. I mean, geez. All right. I'm excited about this too. Item 10.3. Resolution 23 slash 24 slash 58. In recognition of Arab American Heritage Month. Whereas for over a century, Arab Americans have been making valuable contributions to virtually every aspect of American society, including medicine, law, business, science and technology, government, literature, arts and entertainment, and in positions of leadership at all levels. Whereas since migrating to the United States, men and women of Arab descent have shared their rich culture and traditions with neighbors and friends while also setting fine examples of model citizens and public servants. Now, let it be resolved that the Mount Diablo Unified School District celebrates the countless past, present, and future contributions of Arab Americans to American society and the state of California, recognizing and honoring the month of April 2023 to be Arab American Heritage Month. He had further resolved that the Mount Diablo Unified School District's Board of Education hereby encourages staff to review the district's equity policy and review cultural literacy resources. And number two, urges the district to observe Arab American Heritage Month with appropriate programs and activities that celebrate the contributions of, Ameri of Arab Americans to the United States. Madam President, this, this item is now in the hands of the board. Madam President, I would like to move to approve resolution 2324-58 in recognition of Arab American Heritage Month. And I also want to just thank um, all of our parents and staff. I feel like um, this year I've seen more than ever um, more cultural celebrations that have happened um, around the Persian New Year recently at many different schools. Um, and it's just really heartwarming to see that. Um, and then um, a couple of resources just to share as well. Um, there is uh, an organization called ING, ING.org, um, has presenters who can come together to any classroom um, and they present together on Islamophobic, Islamophobia and anti Semitism um, to really bring people together and increase understanding. Um, and then Governor Newsom recently included a resource in um, a letter that he wrote to Arab Americans, um, and it's ca versus hate.org. So ca vs hate.org is a non emergency multilingual hate crime and incident reporting hotline. Um, so just a resource out there for people. Thanks. Second. The motion from Trustee Cowan and a second from Trustee and Zaley. And that motion passes 5-0. All right. Can I go now? All right. I yes, get, please. I get a little excited when I see the young people. So we're gonna um we're gonna have uh 
Eileen Lee um, introduce our wonderful um, guests, and we're going to hear about these great programs that the board here really does make a priority and support with throughout our district. Good evening, board trustees, president of the board, McFerrin, superintendent, Dr. Clark. Thank you so much. It's my absolute pleasure to inform the board, the school district, the community of the updates in International Baccalaureate. We are now three schools strong as authorized IB World Schools and soon to be a fourth. So without further ado, school site by school site. First up, our candidate school for the primary years program is led by head of school, principal, Bess Inzio. Technical difficulties. <laughs> Almost there. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having us here. We're thrilled to share with you um, how our IB journey is going. We are in the candidate stage, and I'm thrilled to announce that we've officially started to ask for authorization visit next year. So we're looking forward to that next March. Um, these are some events from the past year that we've had with teachers collaborating, attending conferences. Also, we just had an amazing training for three days um, with our IB consultant, Randy Cook. And he spent three days with our staff, our entire staff, learning all about the IB. Um, and so we're really proud from custodian to office staff to noon supervisor, everyone was there. So it was really wonderful to have our staff there. And then he worked collaboratively with our teachers on their um, transdisciplinary units that they've been creating. Um, and I would say what's really exciting is that next fall we'll be implementing our additional language because a component of IB is to have an additional language. So we work with our stakeholders and um, we will be contracting with Spanish for the fall, which is very exciting. Um, and so we've been working on this. We just had a parent informational night just last week. Um, so we're really working towards um, our authorization. The highlight of our program is why I brought all of our superheroes tonight, um, is the highlight of our program is focusing, because IB really focuses on the student learner and also on the IB learner profile traits. So I wanted to bring some special guests with us so they could teach you about our IB learner profile traits. And I'm gonna start with our school counselor, Annie Haglin. Thank you so much for having us. I'm Annie Haglin, I'm our school counselor. I run our social superheroes program at Monty Gardens. And the whole structure is based around the IB learner profile attributes. Um, and our students are here to share a little bit more about our program. Uh, my name is Zachary. And I just want to say, first of all, thank you, uh, Dr. Clark and the school board for inviting us here tonight. So each month we have a Social Superheroes Award Ceremony to talk about IB Learner Profile attributes and award students who have done a great job of showing these attributes. Um, my name is Casey and the IB Learner Profile attributes are inquirer, communicator, acknowledgeable, thinker, principled, caring, open-minded, balanced, risk-taker, and reflective. Each month we focus on a different attribute and celebrate two to three students from each class who show that trait. My name is McLean, and it's a really fun assembly because when we get caught up, we get to go on stage with Miss Annie and Miss India. We get a certificate, and then we get to take our picture with a social superhero cutout. The pictures are hung in the office with our beautiful faces on it. Hello. Um, so I'm a, at the end of the day, we have a social superheroes clap ball. All the students who got an award get to parade around our school while music is playing. And the whole school comes out to clap for our superheroes. 
I like social superheroes because it shows you're a leader to the younger kids that might need some help. You want the shades on? Hold on. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> My name is Noah. Parents are invited to join the club of and Monte or Mountain Lion mascot comes to cheer us to on too. I like social superheroes because it's program because it is fun. I like it because it helps kids feel like they stand out. It makes me feel that I I I am smart and that I deserve it. Social superheroes help kids feel like they can do more in class because they feel special. So we just wanted to say thank you and we'd love to invite you over sometime when we have our today we had our social superheroes and we had our clap off at the end of the day. So we'll have to send you an invite for the next time so you can join us. Thank you. And next click, pretty please, is um, from Sequoia Elementary IB Primary Years Program is Becky Bachiskis. Thank you, Aline. Um, I brought with me some friends from our school tonight as well. Um, as Aline said, I'm Becky Bachiskis, proud principal of Sequoia Elementary. And with me tonight, I have two of my third graders, one happens to be my own personal child, my own son, Mateo Bacikis, as well as um, Jackson and his dad, um, Lance Gray, are also here to share about our school. So Lance, you want to come on up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. So um, I want to start by letting you know that uh, uh, Sequoia is going to have a few opportunities to see them in action, see the students and the staff in action. Um, on the multicultural event that will be coming up on Friday, April 12th from 5 to 8 p.m., as well as a fifth grade exhibition that will be on Friday, May 17th from 8 a.m. to 9.15. Um, I, I, I wanted to also let you know that uh, one of the things I, my wife, Nicole, really love about Sequoia is uh, we've seen how involved the parents are uh, and believe me, my wife, Nicole, is very involved in the school, and she's uh, a big part of uh, a lot of things like the spa and, and the other other types of uh, committees that are there at school. But the other thing I really enjoy is how involved Jackson is. And, you know, he's very, he's very insistent upon his homework being done before he goes out to play. And he's very insistent on getting to school at a certain time every day, which is about 20 minutes before class so he can play basketball. So uh, I appreciate his enthusiasm towards Sequoia before and after school. And I hope it's just as strong during school. So um, I really thank you. I thank the staff of Sequoia. Thank you. Thank you, Lance. And I'll just mention that one of the reasons why I think the students in third grade have such a focus on healthy habits is because it is one of their IB units that they study. So they actually are studying about what's make what makes a healthy habit. Um, that's one of the core units that they study during the year. Okay, now I'd like to invite the students to come up and we can go to the, oh, before we go, let me just tell you about the pictures. I'm sorry, go back. Thank you, Eric. Um, so the pictures there, the one on the bottom is one of our new murals that um, we're excited to go up in the school. We have one being put together by each grade level and um, under the direction of our garden educator who's been working on lots of different projects at our school. So that one is about communicators and the students all co-created the content of that mural and actually helped to paint it. So every grade level, has a mural in their outdoor area outside where their classes are that's being installed right now. So this is the first one that's completed. On the bottom going around, we have one of our students from the STEM fair that we held who did a fantastic project about um, turning milk into plastic and did some real experiments and also showed up looking like a very professional scientist. Um, at the top on the right hand side, we have a kindergartner who's engaging in one of our math tasks that they work on. 
And um, above at the top is some of the staff attending um, one of the conferences that we attended in Los Angeles for the IB training. And in the middle is two third grade students who are working on action research. And I tell them in third, fourth and fifth grade, they can make appointments to see me directly. So that's in my office. And they came in with a plan for what they're working on their action research. And I thought they looked so studious and ready to learn that I took their picture sitting across from me at my desk. And then the final picture there is from our third grade heritage feast, where many of the students um, learned for the first time that there were other students who were also um, in that picture from Mexico uh, as they came in and brought heritage food from their different cultures. So that's an explanation of the pictures there. And now, thank you, Eric, if you could turn this slide. Okay, now, and Mateo, please come up. <laughs> So we're going to talk a little bit about these four goals. These are the four things that we're working on to further our IB work this year. So Jackson, could you read the first goal? Hi, my name is Jackson, and it is an honor to be here. The first goal is continue the use of inquiry in hands-on practice. Thank you, Jackson. So um, two of the main things that we're doing this year to work on this is that we do have collaboration times that the teachers have released time six times a year for half a day where they're working together to refine those units that they built. So as uh, my colleague Bess was just talking about, her teachers are working on building these transdisciplinary units, but there's a process of reflection and revision that happens every year. After the teachers teach a unit, the whole grade level will get together and um, revise it based on, you know, that's part of being an IB school is being reflective. So the teachers are also doing that. And the second is that we have really um, embraced so strongly these math practices that the whole district is working on in terms of using visibly random groupings and also, um, you know, the non-permanent whiteboard surfaces and working on different math tasks. Okay, and goal number two, Jackson. The goal number two is to expand international mindedness in the core curriculum. Thank you so much, Jackson. So um, two things that we wanted to point out there is that we, um, for the past 18, 20 months, have been working on developing international contacts with different schools so that every class has a connection with a school and a class in a different country. So um, it's been a work in progress. And I really wanna thank Ms. Margo Lipkin, who's our STEAM lab teacher, who's taken up um, working on this project and really turned it into reality. But we have a connection from every class to a class in a different country at this point, as far away as Qatar, Rwanda, um, all over the place, <laughs> really, it's quite exciting. And the second is that we are having our first time this school-wide multicultural event. And I really do hope that some of the board members and Dr. Clark, if you're able to make it, we would love to have you there. We have so far over 36 countries and cultures represented in our school community who are gonna be giving presentations that evening. So we hope to see you there. All right, Mateo, goal number three. Hello, my name is um, Mateo Vichikis. Num um, num goal number three, cre create optimal support for social, emotional wellness to each and every student. Thank you, my family. So um, we really have made a focus of our staff meetings to work on training of recognizing students who need support for social emotional wellness. We work with the county office wellness and schools program to do training about um, learning how to be kind of a first responder and triage kids who need more help and refer them to professional services and just um, you know make sure that everybody is getting what they need. We also have recently started um, a friendship club where I ask the teachers to give us the names of students who might need support to develop a close friendship or somebody who they felt connected with. And then we're doing that during recess time that they're getting to do curated activities together with somebody who um, they'd like to play with. And um, we're also, you know, we have a very strong screening and child find procedure to look for students who need additional support with their academics. And I'm very proud of that team. It's a very integral part of our school. Our resource specialist um, is just fantastic as well as the other members of that team. And last but not least, we are able to use site funds as well as parent donations to um, employ our full-time counselor, just like Monty Gardens. Um, so that we have the real benefit of providing lots of different things at our school in terms of proactive lessons based on things that come up. So if kids are having trouble getting along um, about a particular issue, the school counselor can go in and do a proactive lesson about that. 
And we also, um, she does see students who need, need assistance for short-term counseling in a general ed setting as well. So that's been fantastic. All right, goal number four. Goal number four, create in inviting and purposeful spaces on campus. Thank you. So I showed you one of the murals, but that's not the only project we've been working on. Um, our campus, like many of the schools in our district, were, was built you know, in the middle of last century. And we've been working, we had Rotary out to do some installation of irrigation so we could revise and refresh our garden boxes. And um, there's just been a lot of work replanting the front garden in the front of the school and generally freshening up the campus. So that's been an important part of our work this year. All right, Jackson, would you like to share your favorite things about Sequoia? Some of my favorite things about Sequoia are playing basketball at recess, writing letters to our class pen pals in Mexico, going to the library to check out books and listen to Miss Connor read us prize winning books. Thank you, Jackson. And Mateo? Some of my favorite things about Sequoia are having a friend that really cares about me, having garden class with Mr. Finn because it is really entertaining, and I also like having a male teacher for a subject. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what Mateo is not saying there is that we have 22 classes at our school and they all are staffed by female teachers, so it's nice to have our garden teacher be a man. So thank you so much for letting us share about our school. We really, um, we love Sequoia and we appreciate your support for our school. Thank you. I will be asking for volunteer mentor help to help support their exhibition project. So keep that in mind. Moving on. Oh, great. They have a huge announcement to share with you. Here's head of school, Dr. Alejandro Ramos and Dr. Um, Shalvin Leopold as our IB coordinator there. Good evening. Alejandro Ramos, principal of Oak Grove Middle School. I got to say, I, have to, I haven't got used to that head of school title, but uh, um, so excited to be here and also equally excited to, you know, formally announce that we were authorized this year as a IB World School. That's... Uh, Significant accomplishment because it's, uh, we, I have to say we struggled and you guys know some of the history, but uh, we came together as a community uh, with your support. Um, I'm gonna highlight the teachers because that's where the heart is. The teachers came together, leaned in, did the work. Um, and also I need to mention Dr. Leopold who was the glue that kind of walked us through this journey and um, I'm gonna give it to her next. Hi everyone, I'm Shafin Leopold and uh, this is my first year um, as a IB coordinator and uh, slash program specialist and uh, so far I enjoy very much and um, that's about me and uh, I um, I really feel like this is a home for me, Old Grove and I see like the warmth and the welcoming from the staff and students. So. I would like to say uh, what we have done, we have completed the design uh, project, which is required uh, by IB program. And teachers just teachers and students have done an awesome job. We're still trying. And hopefully next year, we're gonna do a better job than this year. Every year, we're gonna do better and better. That's the hope. And um, for example, we teachers have done like a, a cat house. That's I. Uh, that's a two. That's a picture over there. And they donate. They do not just like the the cat house. They donated the cat houses to the ARF, that is the Animal um, Rescue Foundation, and they really use those cat houses for the uh, the cats. And uh, the ARF send the pictures to us. But unfortunately, I I forgot. I just uh, attached device too late. Hopefully next time I'll show you. And um, another picture is about the alien stations. So we displayed all the um, the students beautiful, beautiful uh, artwork in the library and it's, it's all over the classrooms as well. So during the ver verification visit and then the, those uh, IBO 
um, professionals, they, they just, they're very amazed about what we have done, what we have achieved. And there's a uh, design, uh, design project. And um, this year we have every teacher did design, but next year we wanna see, we wanna do things differently. We're gonna embed the design into our uh, science. So 50 uh, hours uh, are required. So um, we feel like this is the better um, decision to better to uh, help students uh, achieve what they want to do. Um, we visited the middle school and um, we also talked to the different um, IB schools and we feel like this is, this is the way uh, to, to make it better. And next one is, um, we are currently learning the rubric uh, grading system. And again, this is required. We have to, we, we now we're the only uh, IB middle school at district. Then we are required to grade students by rubrics. So we are grading students by rubrics, but then we need to transfer to the letters. So that we're still learning that and so far so good. And next would be the, uh, we have, so students currently are doing the community project and uh, prepare for the presentations. And um, they, we're still learning. And I, right now I received the, we have about 80 groups. So we have, students can do that individually, but we require, like a maximum would be three students. The reason is we do not want students to do that individually. So they work as a group so they can help each other. Um, so then when they promote it to the high school, so they can start to do their personal project is kind of transition. Uh, so we will currently have about uh, 243 students uh, in eighth graders and about 80 groups. So we're gonna have the community project event and the open house on May 8th, that will be the Wednesday and you're all invited. So feel free, hopefully we're gonna see you all of you um, at the event. That's all I have. Do you have any questions? <laughs> And our diploma program at the high school, Ignatia Valley High, under the direction of head of school, Jonathan Pike, and IB coordinator, Carissa Weintraub. Good evening. Um, we can't compete with the, the awesome, <laughs> we don't have any capes, but I am wearing um, our team robotics gear swag. That's why I'm not wearing a tie today. Um, I, it gives me great honor, and, and I'm very pleased to, to kind of be able to speak about our IB program. It is a pillar of our school. Um, in many, many ways. And um, I would be um, selling it short if I was to be able to talk about it. So we have, I'd like to introduce our program specialist, Ms. Carissa Weintraub. She has um, been uh, with IB since its conception at our school. So I'm gonna turn it over to her and there you go. All right, good evening. Um, I First off, I wanna say I am so excited to learn more about the elementary school program because I can see, since I've been living IB for the last, what, eight years, I can see how it's all connecting. And uh, it's very exciting to see the, the like I, I'm, I'm living the continuum now. And um, it's, it warmed my heart incredibly. So I'm glad you guys came, thank you. Um, so IB, we were the first IB school in the Mount Davis School District. Um, and we had our first graduating class in 2019. Since then, we continue to grow the program. We've had a feeling since it first started that IB is not a special program for special kids. IB is a program for all. And we have been saying that from the beginning with all of our teachers, we've been training them. We have made sure that IB, that every student at our school has access to IB. And we quickly learned that it's more than just if their students are allowed to take IB if they want to, we have to encourage students. We have to give them supports. We have to make sure that they know that they can succeed in these classes. And, um, and I think that we've been very successful at doing that. It is 
you walk into an IB class and you can see the students that are engaged. You can see students I know, for example, that have IEPs that speak a second language, even students that are not reclassified as English fluent, and they're all in our IB classes and doing very well in learning in our classes. And it's just very exciting. Uh, so we've been doing this now for a while. Uh, we did successfully complete our five-year review cycle with IB last year. So we've, we've did that first one and we're moving on to the next one in four years from now. Uh, we are going to continue to focus on increasing the number of students in our IB classes uh, to especially re better reflect our YVHS student body. We wanna provide, our goal is to provide more effective support for all of our students so that they feel that success. Uh, we also now want to partner with Oak Grove and the middle schools or the elementary schools to really live that IB continuum. Um, and finally, the other goal that we have is to really work on building that community and family partnerships. Yeah. And our students wish they could be here, but they're like, yeah, Miss Weintraub, it's vacation. So <laughs> it's okay. Thank you so very much. And I'm sorry two minutes turned into 20. Last thing, we really do need your help. A part of the IB um, curriculum is to bring the community in, and that is to have 30 mentors. I have 10 right now. The project starts the first week in April after break, of course, so second week of April, my, my uh, mistake. So if you could, I will share with the board the link. Please take on a group of two or three fifth graders. It's only a commitment of 15 to 20 minutes. Dr. Clark, do you have time? It's only once a week. It's a great experience. Um, it will be their culminating projects. Everyone at Sequoia uh, Elementary and Monte Gardens is invited. We need parents. You need to be trained. Everyone at the district office, every community member, please come. Uh, to let you know, really, YV is... Um, spreading its wings to all. It's going to have IB for all. So IB language and lit will be um, HL year one for all 11th graders. That's exciting news, right? Spanish is starting at Monte Gardens. We have Mandarin. We have French. Um, there are going to be more of these collaborative regional meetings between all the heads of schools, and we are working towards an IB continuum. Come on out May 8th for the community project at Oak Grove. And please, May 17th exhibition mentors come you'll you'll you won't regret it thank you very much thank you for the update sorry ladies and thank gentlemen you. good night thank you if we could um I'm sorry parents but kids got to go home now but, <laughs> but you're, you're free to stay for the end of the night but we really want to thank you all for participating and for bringing your children out and sharing the wonderful things that are going on at the programs thank you thank you Thank you. Thank you so much. And it really is wonderful to see the, the yeah. whole continuum from yeah. elementary through high school. See you. Bye-bye. Hey, how are you? Hi, superheroes. <laughs>it sounds like there are a lot of great um, events coming up and I'm just hopeful that um, I try to jot down as much information as I could um, but I'm just also hopeful that we'll um, kind of get further information so that we can make sure to make it to some of these events at the different sites I'll bet presentation is in the agenda which has to mark my calendar thank you for that reminder um, okay, so that um, so with that we move to board member reports I think we started on this side last time so if if you're um, ready, Trustee Mason, we'd love to hear from you. I got nothing. I was off the grid all last week, traveling in Utah and Arizona, and didn't have a computer or many times the phone. So got nothing for you tonight. That sounds wonderful. Um, Trustee Mayo. Thank you very much. 
Um, well, I'll take up a little of your time. Yeah, you <laughs> okay. Uh, I attended the Contra Costa County Science and Eng Engineering Fair Judging and Awards Ceremony held on March 7th and 8th. Uh, Mr. Ferrante was one of our chief judges at this event. We had 130 students that competed and more than 100 volunteer judges who evaluated projects on March 7th at Los Madonnas College. And Los Madonnas welcomes there uh, at no cost. The gym floor was filled with projects from students grades 7 through 12. And the sweepstakes winners compete in the California State STEM Fair, the Renjanon International STEM Fair, and the Lemonson Middle School competition. Um, this fair is the gateway fair for student competition uh, grades 7 through 12. And the awards list with the project titles, which are pretty amazing, can be viewed by typing in Contra Costa CCC Science and Engineering Fair 2024, and then clicking on the 2024 uh, awards link. Um, and I would like to share that more than $9,000 in prize money was awarded at the, at the um, ceremony on Saturday by our generous donors. And of course, students winning at the sweepstakes level and the California State Fair level will also have the opportunity to compete for prizes or um, money for college, et cetera. Uh, I attended the four-day conference with the California African American Association of Superintendents and Administrators in San Diego. The Brown versus Topeka, Kansas, uh, Topeka Board of Education themed conference was packed with workshops and six plenary sessions, uh, which are also general meetings. Uh, it's one, been one of the hardest working conferences I've been to in a long time. Of the nine workshop sessions with many sessions uh, to choose from, Mount Diablo presented two sessions which were very well received. Participants eagerly asked questions regarding the implementation processes that we began and our successes and requested contact information and most importantly, our PowerPoint slides. Mm -hmm. Dr. Clark's installation as the state president was an evening highlight. On March 18th, um, Ms. Mason and I attended, oh no, I'm sorry, it was Ms. Count and I attended the WASP review committee meeting for uh, Mount Diablo High School. And based on the comments I heard, the committee members were very thorough in listening to all the groups, uh, the faculty members, the students, and the parents during their visits. And I believe their comments will be reflected in uh, the WASC report. The, uh, and it was with great joy that I attended the Mount Diablo Council of PTA's 100th anniversary celebration on March 20th. Many of you were invited. Um, the council was organized in on March 1st, 1924, and I found a booklet about the council uh, dated 1956, mm -hmm. and this council included PTA schools in unincorporated, unincorporated, unincorporated areas of Lafayette, Walnut Creek, Danville, Pleasant Hill, Concord, Bay Point, and Pittsburgh. As school districts were formed, many PTAs were assigned to new council PTAs. Joining the celebration were six past presidents. Lots of stories and laughter echoed in this room. And a re retired principal, Cheryl Colano, was awarded the Golden Oak Award, California State PTA's highest honorary service award. Mount Diablo Council will also be recognized at the California State PTA Annual Conference May 3rd through 5th in Ontario. I want to congratulate College Park High School, um, law, the uh, faculty and the students, law enforcement, con fire, and emergency service respondents, and the parents for the very effective and sobering every 15 minute presentation to juniors and seniors last Thursday and Friday. And um, just to announce the Mount Diablo Education Foundation Botsy Ball Tournament is May 11th in Clayton. Come out to join the fun. Sideliner lunches are now available for sale on the Mount Diablo Education Foundation.org website. And view the list of generous sponsors on the website. 16 teams will compete and raffle prizes will be awarded. Thank you. Thank you.
Trustee Anzawi, do you have a report this evening? Um, first, this week was the, I don't even know what it's called, but all the choirs, the high school choirs got together. It was quite beautiful, Concord High School. Um, they rehearsed all day together. Well, all day at, from lunch on together. And um, that was beautiful. But again, I was there as a mom, so I shouldn't like, <laughs> but it was fun. And then on the weekend, we got to enjoy instrumental music at Concord High School, um, which what I was impressed with, besides probably annoying people by calling them band geeks because I was one and I was like trying to make connections that like I'm like a band geek from fifth grade from 40 years ago all the way through college and even into my now adulthood going in and out of community um, bands when I've continued to play. Um, but what I really appreciated about the Concord High music program was the variety of what I I can only assume our student led ensembles because there's not enough periods in the day that there could be this many different music classes. Um, and especially I'm, well, I don't want to call out one because then that might offend, but nobody's watching Thelonious Punk because I loved the name of it. And it literally was like punk jazz. Like if you like, um, it was really cool as I was analyzing the music that we're hearing and the in, the clear influence of Thelonious Monk and punk. <laughs> so I was digging it. And there are also a slight infusion of vocal music within their instrumental music program. So congratulations to their program as well. And then I too was at the CASA Conference, California Association of African-American um, Superintendents and Administrators. And I feel like it was sort of glossed over. We did not bring him his crown, but <laughs> Dr. Clark is the new president which has been a long time coming because they have like several years of president elect and then president and then past president, like you're always in power. Um, so, but it's, it was beautiful and it was great that so many in our district were there, but more important, it's important that so many from our district was there for all the learnings that trustee Mayo mentioned. Um, what I took from that conference being focused on the 70th anniversary of the Brown versus board of education decision what I, there's a lot that I took away, but really understanding um, the roots and purpose of that lawsuit, which was a, about resources and not so much about desegregating schools, but also the harms um, that happened to black educators and black children and black families because of that decision and how it was implemented um, and, and how we continue to live through that and, and experience that today. Um, I was really, I didn't, I, we had to present two workshops from our district and I could only go to one. Um, but the one I was in was packed. If I recall, we were all there. It was jam packed and fun to watch Dr. Francis and Rashid um, talk about our African-American, are, are we called the African-American Achievement Program? Like, I know, like, do, what is our, the name of our program? Like, that's what it, the generic name across the state for all the folks programs. But um, people were really engaged and excited about that. They were like little superstars getting paparazzi at the end, getting people getting their picture taken. But more importantly, I think asking um, how they do it. Um, the other big learning that I took away from this conference is that everyone wins when they have a black educator. Um, it showed that, uh, some of the data that was presented was that black students um, have greater achievement when they have a black educator, but it also showed that all students have greater achievement when they have a black educator, that, um, that all students, this is from, um, now I can't remember his name, but he's famous, Dr. Somebody. There was lots of doctors in there. <laughs> Dr. So-and-so, I have my notes on my phone, but I don't wanna pull that out. Um, said that in the re this research shows that students um, have a higher, like, it's not just like, but I can't think of the right word, but appreciate their Black and Latino teachers more than their white teachers. And I'm not, this is not to say to put down white teachers, but just, I think there's something different in the way that these educators make connections with students. 
um, and that it wasn't that that was across all student groups um, had more favorable views of those teachers and black teachers are more likely to just expect their black students will go to college and finish college um, and I am a firm believer in always not just in education that when black people have everything they need and when that's that means everybody does because we're in almost every measure have do not have what we need um in education or health or housing or transportation all of those things but if you so if you give the most to the least then everybody wins so i've um i'm hearkening back to last year when we had in our district if you remember we had a nice slew when we had our really big slew of um administrator hires and um and we just had a lot of black administrators coming into our district and that was really exciting to see and important and it's probably harder to get also black classroom teachers because cost of living coming to California most teachers are produced by HBCUs which do not are not in California um but how important it is for our district to be intentional about recruiting a diverse workforce um and and I know that we're taking um, intentional steps to do that. So much appreciation to us to do that. I hope we can do it even more successfully this year and in all the future years so that all of our students can win. Thank you so much. Um, yes, I agree with so much of what you said and so much, so many of the learnings that we had at the CASA conference um, that help us understand how we got to where we are today and a lot of the inequities that we have, a lot of the um, uh, primarily um, white teachers versus teachers of color came out of how the how the laws were implemented. Um, and so there's a lot, a lot to undo and a lot to work on. Um, so I too am proud of you, Dr. Clark, for being president of CASA. So congratulations. Um, but it was wonderful for us, I think, as board members to be able to see you not only as the leader of this district, but also of this statewide organization that encourages, you know, I we we experience you here in Mount Diablo, um, encouraging people and encouraging all of us to learn not only from each other within the district, but from the wider world around us. And I feel like the CASA conference was also um just implement, emblematic of that whole um, vision there. It was incredible to have, um, like you said, so many doctors, <laughs> PhDs. Um, you know, we had Linda Darling Hammond, we had Pedro de Guerra, um, just um, amazing um, workshops and, and research that was presented. Um, but, and then also I felt like it was um, a model of how we can all be as as educators and as leaders to remember um, that it's not just about information, it's about relationships, it's about community, um, it's about uh, the heart and the personal stories. Um, and, and so that was something that I got from the CASA conference as well that I feel like was a little bit different than um, other conferences that I've been to. Um, so really appreciate. Um, your work there and also um, all of your colleagues um, and the leaders of, of CASA who made that all possible. Um, and I would recommend others to go to the CASA conference um, next year. And um, in addition, I'm just so excited about all the things that we have to celebrate from our teachers of the year tonight to our classified employees of the year coming up. Um, and congratulations to Diablo View Middle School for being a distinguished school. Um, and I just enjoyed getting to go out and celebrate people um, at uh, Walnut Acres Elementary in my area. Um, teachers organized a whole celebration for Mia Carella, um, including all the students out on the blacktop, um, creating like a maze for her to come out and run through and be able to high five everybody along the way with her parents there at the end. It was, it was just beautiful. Um, so I just love seeing all those kinds of ways that we find to, uh, to celebrate um, our, our wonderful teachers and employees and, and families. Um, and, uh, I was able to go to the, um, International Baccalaureate 
oh, we went together to the International Baccalaureate Awards Gala. Um, so being able to see the, the end point and then now today being able to see the beginning <laughs> of our IB students. Um, and then also the uh, DLAC meeting um, last week, I wanna thank United Latino Voices for coming to present at the DLAC meeting and um, sharing their stories of how they were able to um, be able to be successful in um, going to college and beyond. Um, and one of the things that um, I think came out of the, the Kabe conference was similar to the, the CASA conference in that um, we need to remember that all parents actually have the expectation and belief that their children can be successful, not only in college, but oftentimes they have a vision that their child will be successful in a master's or PhD, right? Um, so for us as educators to have any kind of lower expectations of students is um, really wrong, <laughs> really not where we wanna be. Um, and, uh, oh, I also got to go to the Northgate High Area Strings Festival, um, which was just fantastic, like all of the other area festivals that we have. Um, it's wonderful to see the progression of music um, from our littles all the way to the bigs. Um, and thank you to all of our music uh, educators out there. Um, and lastly, when you mentioned um, Trustee Mayo, the Science and Engineering Fair, I want to recognize that you were not only attending, but you have been uh, an incredible piece of not of, of founding that fair to begin with and making sure that it uh, continues to thrive every single year. So thank you so much, uh, Trustee Mayo. And when I heard the um, IB uh, uh, presentation at about Oak Grove Middle School talking about putting infusing more design into their science courses, I thought, hmm. There are opportunities here for those students to present at our Contra Costa County Science and Engineering Fair, for sure. So um, that is all that I have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Trustee Cam. Um, so um, I um, have been um, lucky to uh, attend some good events recently. Um, so on March 11th, um, I went to the Latino Parent Night at Concord High, um, there was a speaker named Juan Congas um, who um, had worked with the staff that morning um, for the Teacher and Service Day um, and um, had focused a speech around how teachers can ensure that their classrooms are welcoming for students. Um, and then um, he spoke with a parent group um, and kind of really um, uh, kind of explained a lot about his experience growing up um, and kind of um, uh, did a really good job of just kind of um, kind of talking through kind of some common um, you know, parenting experiences, um, and um, there was kind of a lot of group work um, and reflections from the group as well, which was nice. Um, so it was very interactive. Um, and then the following day, he spoke um, in student assemblies about inclusivity on campus. Um, and then on March 19th, I went to the Parent Advisory Council meeting. The presentation was on creating positive and engaging school climates, um, which um, is kind of always a thrill for me. That's really um, something that interests me. Um, specifically kind of around PBI, sorry, PBIS and MTSS, um, uh, that's um, positive behaviors, inter behavior um, intervention and supports, and then multi-tiered systems of support, um, kind of, and so on. And, and people had the opportunity to talk about kind of what, um, what positive things were happening on their campuses. And that was really interesting to hear um, from the people at my table group about that. Um, and then I also was able to um, attend and enjoy the instrumental music dinner showcase at Concord High last Saturday. Um, the theme was Music Takes Us Anywhere, um, and the performances um, were incredible, um, and um, it seemed like a really successful night. The, um, the multi-use room was really transformed, um, and um, I know a tremendous amount of effort um, went into kind of every facet um, of that evening, um, from the incredible um, dedication from um, the teacher to um, the parent involvement to the students, um, all the practicing um, many other members of the school site. So it was, um, I enjoyed it very much. It was a wonderful evening. Um, and that's all I have to share this evening. Dr. Clark. I have a, um, just a, a short couple of few words I'd like to share. Um, I don't have a, I don't have a presentation, but I did want to, first and foremost, I wanted to thank the support of the trustees for, um, for again, for attending the CASA conference and supporting my um, presidency. You know, as a as a superintendent of a large district, 
um, and, and especially one of, of Mount Diablo's um, size and, um, you know, many of the complexities that we have here, I'm expected within my, within the California state administrative standards to be um, an influencer on um, educational policy and practices. And so um, we're expected as superintendents to join organizations and to participate and to also be leaders within those organizations. So whether it is AXA, which stands for the Association of California School Administrators, or whether it's our, um, nat, our, our state AXA or local AXA, um, or PALSA, which um, represents our Latino students and populations, or whether it's being involved in the fiscal aspect of it, being involved with FICMAG, another statewide organization. So um, I'm honored to represent Mount Diablo on many in, of these organizations. And um, everything that I do outside of the district is collecting best practices and, and the latest and greatest research so that we can better enhance what's going on here in, in Mount Diablo. And what I'm finding is we are one of the leaders in the state in public education. There are many folks who are looking towards us to what we are doing, the programs that we have in this district, our commitment to students over the, the needs of adults is something that is, that is monumental. Um, I'm involved um, in you know, the Northern California Superintendents Association. So we, we have members in Shasta County, El Dorado County, all, you know, all over Northern California, but also here in, the, here in the Bay Area. I'm also part of the California High School Coalition where um, um, uh, superintendents of, of districts that are primarily high schools and who have large high schools, we get together on a state level and really talk about policies and advocate for our, for our high school districts. I'm also part of the national organization, the Educational Resource and Design Institute, where I'm able to collaborate and work with um, superintendents from throughout the nation to talk about best practices and work with um, innovative companies to review the latest and greatest products for, um, for our students and for our educators. But I'm most proud to lead the California Association of African-American Superintendents and Administration. Our African American students um, have have many needs because there has been um, laws and practices that have really um, negatively impacted the success of African American students. Um, anyone who knows me knows that I'm committed to all students, but um, but this is the organization where I feel I can have the greatest impact. Um, another group that that I advocate for throughout the state is our students with special needs, and so. Um, so that's another group where, again, we're talking about ways that we can support our students with, with special needs and set those high expectations. So I'm very proud of the work that we're doing here in Mount Diablo. And although my responsibilities, you know, allow me to um, interact and lead in, in, these, in these organizations, I could not do that without the support of the board and without a very competent and um, successful cabinet and support staff here at the district office. And so um, I, I have a great deal of appreciation for all those who are working together to meet our, our goals and mission within this district. And so again, just wanted to thank you for that and just acknowledge that. Um, and, as, and as we look at some of the things that are, that are happening in our district, I do want to give a tremendous shout out to the um, parent organizations of College Park and of Concord High who took on um, doing every 15 minutes. Um, you know, that's something that really impacts our young people throughout. And that's one of those um, life skills that they can learn that could save their lives or the lives of, of others. And it's really making our community safer. I've spoken many times about the work of Linda Pete within our district who's doing the fentanyl presentations and they were at Riverview Middle School last night, again, doing those, those presentations. And they're, they're extremely difficult because they talk about students within our district that we've lost to, um, to fentanyl and to drug overdoses. And so again, um, 
if those are things that we can do to to support our students, then then I'm I'm proud that we're doing that. Um, also, the over the last several weeks and and coming up in the next few weeks, we, we do have um, you know multiple band concerts where it's you know everywhere for our elementary, middle, and high school students who are able to come together and really display what they've learned and and um, really establish that love of arts and, um, and, 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 and music. And so that's something that we're, we're very excited about. And then when you talk about the academic achievement of our students, you know, our students are, are here to be, um, to be educated. And that's what we, that's what we focus on each day, all day, every day. Now, in order to make that happen, we have to make sure that their social emotional needs are met. We have to make sure that our students feel, um, you know, um, welcomed and accepted in all of our classrooms and all of our spaces. But also in order to do that, we have to work with our employees and making sure that they have the latest training and opportunities to be at their best. And I think we saw a display of that tonight with the five teachers that we um, that we that we recognized. And every year, you know, we, we go through a process of identifying those exemplary teachers. But we have a whole army of, of educators within our within our district. Um, another thing that we lead on is our food service program. The, the healthy meals that we provide our students, like taking care of their basic needs. And it's not just a, a hamburger slopped on a bun with some microwave French fries. We are serving um, natural food, healthy food to our students and really implementing that love of, of healthy eating in, in, into the lives of our students. So we just are, are doing so much and and I'm, I'm really pleased that we have kind of, as a district, we've shifted away from, you know, talking about the pandemic and talking about what we can't do and what we've lost and stuff. And we're really having that opportunity just to build on those, on those programs and those practices and those values that are going to benefit our students and our communities. And so um, it, it's really a testament to the leadership of this board of what you all prioritize and the direction that you give to me so that I can implement your vision within this district. So um, so we just have lots of things taking place, but I really wanted to just highlight a, a few of those. The other thing that I wanna, that I wanna call out and bring attention to is that um, we are hosting our, our Pride Prom um, and that's coming up on, on May 11th at Concord High School. It's open to all of Mount Diablo um, High School students, but it's also open to the students of De La Salle and Crondelet and Clayton Valley Charter, where they don't have those opportunities to come to a place and be safe. And again, these are our students and, and they feel, um, you know, sometimes uncomfortable and sometimes they're bullied and sometimes they're not accepted. And the national narrative um, is, is all about ways to silence them and to, um, you know, bully them. And so, again, we create this space where they can come together and be acknowledged and enjoy their prom without being teased or being, um, um, you know, um, um, kind of criminalized for for their decisions and, and whatnot. So, just just many things happening. But again, just want to just want to thank this board, thank the staff for all that we're doing to support our students. And so, with that, that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Clark. Um, so that moves us to um, to 14.0, our consent agenda. Um, are there any items anyone would like to pull for discussion? If not. I would make a motion that we accept the agenda as it's presented. Thank you. That's a motion from Trustee Mason and a second from Trustee Mayo. That motion passes um, five zero. Okay, um, so that moves us to our business action items, um, seventeen point one. Um, we have a presentation on this. Yeah, I'm going to introduce um, 
I'm going to introduce uh, one of our attorneys who works with our district, and that is um, John Ye. And we've heard from Mr. Ye many times in this um, in this boardroom. And so Mr. Ye is going to give us an update on our um, charter school facilities and Prop 39 offers to um, to one of our local charter schools. Mr. Ye, the floor is yours. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Thank you, Dr. Clark, for the introduction. Good evening, President McBaron, trustees. Uh, John Ye from Burke, Williams, and Sorensen. Uh, I know that you've... Uh, taken action on Proposition 39 uh, in past years. I'm going to give just a very brief uh, primer on the legal requirements. So Proposition 39 is the state education code that obligates school districts to uh, offer charter schools reasonably equivalent facilities if the charter schools are eligible. So for a charter school to be eligible, it has to project at least 80, age zero, uh, units of ADA uh, for the what we call the request year and uh, the year that uh, they're requesting facilities is for 2425. And I know you've uh, you've acted on a number of offers in the past. Uh, this year's offer was a uh, uh, request was made by the School of Performing Arts to Spa Charter. Uh, uh, they are authorized, as you know, by the County Board of Education, uh, but Prop 39 does uh, still impose the requirement or the obligation to uh, provide facilities, even if it's not a, uh, a, um, uh, a charter school that's authorized by the school district. Uh, so there's a reasonable equivalence uh, uh, standard in terms of condition and capacity, and, and, and district staff has done all the required analysis uh, to support it in the offer. Uh, you might recall the Prop uh, 39 deadline uh, or timeline that starts with the November 1st request for facilities, and that's when we re received the request from SPA. Uh, there's, an, there's an intervening back and forth that we participated in, and now we're at the tail end of it. Uh, so the next deadline is ours, the district's. It's the April 1st deadline to issue the final offer. Uh, and then SPA has until May 1st to respond to either to accept the offer or to, to decline it. And I should point out that the obligation on the district is to make the offer of a reasonably equivalent facility. Uh, if the charter school declines it, then the district's uh, obligation is, extingu is extinguished for the school year. So we will know by May 1st. Uh, we are asking uh, the board to approve and give direction uh, to the superintendent to uh, issue a written final offer to School of uh, Performing Arts of 11 classrooms um, uh, at Riverview Middle School and uh, associated sharing space to be worked out if the charter school accepts the offer. Uh, and we will know no later than May 1st uh, whether uh, SPA accepts the offer. I will note as background uh, that SPA currently is self-citing. Uh, it's taken out long-term facilities financing uh, and has its own facility. Uh, so uh, we, will, we will see where the district's offer falls into their larger plans. Uh, so the, the request is for the board to uh, authorize the issuance of a written offer of 11 classrooms and shared spaces, uh, if necessary, at Riverview, and to direct the superintendent and staff to issue the, the final offer by the April 1st deadline. And I will turn it back to Dr. Clark. Do you have any questions or comments for Mr. Yeh, or are we ready to I would make a motion that the board approve the all allocation of 11 classrooms and shared space at Riverview Middle School under Proposition 39 for 24-25 and direct staff to issue a final offer by April 1st, 2024. Second. Motion from Trustee Mason and a second um, by Trustee Count. And that motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Yang. Thank you. We'll take it from here. Good to see everyone. Thanks, sir. Okay. Um, so we move to 17 point. Sorry, just the feedback. Um, 
We moved to 17.2 review and potential approval of the tentative agreement between Mount Diablo School Psychologist Association and Mount Diablo Unified School District for the 2022 to 2025 school year to resolve the reopener provisions. to you the we had a reopener for the let's bug contract for the 24 25 school year on salary and benefits we did meet with with mutzba and did come to an agreement and that agreement is before you tonight i move that we approve the tentative agreement between mount diablo school psychologist association and mount diablo unified school district for the 2022 2025 school years to resolve the reopener provisions. I'll second that and thank you to all who worked together collaboratively to come to this agreement. Motion by Trustee Nzewi and a second by Trustee Count. And that motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, so that should move us to 17.3, um, the review and potential approval of the 2022-23 uh, school accountability report cards, the SARCs. Yeah, Madam President, we, we brought this uh, several weeks um, back, and we had, there was a glitch in the platform that we used to, to post these. And so um, that glitch has been addressed. We have updated all of the school accountability report cards, and, um, and we are asking for approval. However, if you have any questions, you have uh, Dr. Chinaway here, unless you have some statements, doctor. Uh, no, just a, a summary on the, uh, I mean, I, just for the SARCs. Uh, so it's a school accountability report card. Actually, I forgot to say, good evening, Dr. Clark, board, community. Um, so the uh, school accountability report card, uh, the SARCs, uh, provides some uh, kind of a uh, background information on our schools and students, kind of just summarizes the school's missions, um, goals, accomplishments, and also provides the academic data, completion rates, graduation rates, class sizes, um, teacher and staff information, curriculum instruction descriptions, uh, post-secondary preparation information, and fiscal and expenditure data. And then like Dr. Clark said, uh, previously, there was a kind of glitch where the um, the data tables weren't being populated at that time, and normally that does occur, uh, but it was more than it usually is. So um, we had to pull this pull this item, and then now everything is populated. And all our all our SARCs are updated, and then if there are any changes, which does occur um, any time from uh, in the in the spring and even uh, uh, later on, they're updated and um, just to keep them to keep them up to date with all our data in there and information. So I'm just bringing this item. Uh, that was a quick information, uh, no presentation, and then just for your approval. Oh, and if you have any questions. I appreciate um, the review of the information and you're bringing them back to us. And I would move that we approve the 22-23 school accountability report cards. I'll second that. Motion by Trustee Mayo and is second by Trustee Mason. And that motion passes 5-0. Thank you. And a thank you to all the school sites for their work in preparing the SARCs. It's, it does involve work at the school sites that we, doesn't go mention. Yes, it definitely does. So thank you. Thanks. All right, so we move to 17.4, uh, review and potential approval of standards aligned English language art, arts materials for middle school and high school English language arts instruction. So, uh, board, as I um, as I spoke earlier about the things that we're doing here in Mount Diablo, I just um, I have to highlight that um, um, since I've came since I've come to Mount Diablo, um, you know, I, I got the charge from the board about our curriculum and um, and working with 
um, working with our dynamic team. We have updated science. We've updated world language. We've updated um, social studies. Uh, we, we need to do secondary English, language arts, and uh, very soon we're going to be doing math. And then all of our, all of our um, curriculum will be updated, which hadn't been updated in, in some time before. So um, I thank this board for, for um, you know, setting that standard for me. I thank our physical department for um, finding the money and balancing our, our budget so that we can afford that. And last but not least, I thank this dynamic team um, under the under the direction of, of Jennifer Sachs um, that has really gone out and um, you know vetted these companies and then piloted the materials and again using the standards that we've set here in Mount Diablo to to bring us the the, the um, you know most uh, comprehensive student friendly effective materials possible. And so, I mean, you know, Susan Hartwig <laughs> is, uh, and Megan Gertz, they're just, they're just superstars in this area. And so, um, she, she, she needs to, she needs to hear it. And so, um, so yeah, so thank you. So share what you have for us this evening. Well, I will go quickly because you, you covered a lot of the bases. Okay, so good. <laughs> good evening, Dr. Clark and board of trustees and, um, Madam President McFerrin, I haven't seen you since you were, you became the president, so congratulations on that. Um, yeah, we, you actually covered quite a bit of the basis. No, I'm glad you did, because that's the idea. We have been through this process, and we are very clear on keeping the protocol the exact same for all of our adoptions, so a lot of this will be review, um, and I know you had access to this, so I want to really get to the point where, you, in this presentation, where you have an opportunity to ask any questions that you might have, but Overall, it's about the equitable access to grade level standards and high quality uh, instructional materials. And in this case, we're talking about the ELA ELD framework and all of the curriculum that um, that comes with that. So uh, in, in short, our protocol is to make contact with basically the, the publishers that are up to our standard. And then we send out a, you know, a um, a survey that helps us to vet exactly who makes the grade. And then we go forward with uh, creating a team and then going through the process and the protocols of piloting and voting and training and all the things that come with it. So I'm gonna go ahead and keep pushing forward because this is where the work, is re work really happens. We can't do this work without the practitioners, our teachers. And we have uh, representatives from every single secondary site and they were incredible in their work. It is not lost on us that it is extra work to do a pilot. There's packing and unpacking and um, you know, familiar, familiarizing yourself and your students with brand new curriculum. So this is a no small task and we have a great deal of appreciation for the people that, um, and the teachers, the highly dedicated teachers that participated in the adoption process. So um, the rationale and our decision uh, was for Savis. And I will, I will mention too that my, uh, uh, my team and I do not have, we, we certainly care, but we do not have a preference when we're in this process. So our fingerprints and our opinions have nothing to do with the decision that our teacher practitioners make when they do this. And that's a, that we hold that very important in the process that it, this, this cannot be my show. It is not at all. So um, these are the main things that we were looking at and it's based on the tool that we use to select. Um, not the least of which uh, support for our multilingual learners and support for resources and families at home. But by and large, the, you know, the comparison between the two piloted programs my perspective, Savis, was overwhelmingly the choice. So that makes it a little easier. Um, the secondary costs, uh, the program costs, uh, you can see the approximations for each middle and high school, and then the very important process of ongoing professional development um, with a total of $5,271,000. And then upcoming adoptions, as Dr. Clark had mentioned, we are uh, we've got some we've got some uh, curriculum on deck, so we've got 
some more coming to you before the end of this school year, um, both with AP Precalculus and other new course materials that have just been released. Also, the middle school and high school ELD and ALD will be coming at you in a few, in a, in a few meetings. And then um, next year, uh, math K-12 in the spring of 2025. So this time next year, hopefully we'll be doing the same process for math. Any questions? Is the, um, thank you. <laughs> um, I didn't notice, this isn't my question, but I didn't notice any teacher from College Park. Um, but my question is, as we had to adopt these today, are they, is the curriculum, like, do, do they get to start it next year? Yes. Yes. Cool. You know, that's an oversight on my part. Uh, Amy Lyons okay, cool. was from College Park. Cool. And she was very helpful and wonderful. And feedback from my child of the online yes, textbooks. I want to hear it. Yes. Of, of the online textbooks. I don't know which one she's talking about. Yes. Because um, on one of the slides, you it said... Um, easy to navigate, like tech integration and usability. Oh, sure, sure. She does not find her online textbooks easy to navigate so far. And I don't know if it's a connectivity problem or she's like, it's there. It's hard to find the pages okay. and then it takes forever to get there. Good feedback. That's a team's feedback. Well, that's that, our user. That from new adoptions that we've just made or? I don't know which class she was talking about. So I can't like, I can't give you good data. <laughs> And that might be oh, what you've asked the other publisher. Right here. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I feel like most of our things that are online are new. Yes. Yeah. That's so, indeed. Um, new. There are some growing pains, you know, as we start to learn how to navigate these new programs, but that's really good feedback. And we always want to hear that. Yes. I will say that that was one of the major ones in terms of the usability that for the, the comparison between the two products that we were, were looking at, that Savis was far superior. Yes. In the data, anyways. I just want to say thank you for especially putting together that uh, diverse team of um, of teachers from all different school sites, um, all different areas, to be able to come up with uh, the rationale that is really going to serve all students. Um, and so I appreciate what what the team came up with here um, and then how how you all were able to make this decision. You know, it is uh, it's a crucial decision because it's it's the next eight years. It's... So we want it to be good <laughs> or yes. or much longer, depending on state funding. See how it goes. <laughs> um, but this is very exciting to see. So thank you so much. Um, any questions? With that, I would move to approve the standards aligned English language arts material for middle school and high school English language arts instruction. I'll second that. A motion from Trustee Cam and a second from Trustee uh, Mason. That motion passes 5 0. Thank you. Very exciting. Thank you. Yes, very exciting. Do we have public comment on this item on 17.5? Okay, great. John Ferrante. Good evening. Um, as it says in your memo, the board, the committee, Bond Oversight Committee for Measure J, is looking for an opinion from legal help. There has been some questions brought up about a contract that is currently going on. Under Prop 39, we are trying to do our due, sorry, we're trying to do our due diligence and we want information. It's more like we need this information. Um, we don't think that the 30 hours that have been requested is unreasonable. Um, this is not a new type of request under 2002 Measure C. 
twice I requested that we get legal opinions. And both times that was granted with no questions asked. It was just get it done and let's move on, and we, which is what we want to do. We want to move on and we want to get our job done. We want to be responsible to the public. So I ask that you please approve this for the 30 hours requested. And as a side note, all those numbers you're seeing, those are Arabic numerals. Do we have another speaker on this item or we're just we're having a discussion? I'd be interested to hear from our board member reps on that committee to see. I, since I've been on the board, I've not seen a request like this. It seems unusual. So I was just curious why you're a rep, right? What what the issue is. Oh, you're talking about our board members, not the community members. I thought you meant our community community member reps. Okay. Um, there are concerns about uh, the lighting contract and uh, whether it was appropriately awarded and other questions that the group has. Um, it's my understanding that the um, committee was granted 15 hours of uh, legal uh, consulting time um, that um, the district presented a list of individuals of attorney firms that have expertise in that sort of contract um, analysis. Um, the committee uh, chair and the committee agreed to, I apologize, uh, to consult with an attorney that may not have expertise in that field. And that it, same attorney uh, said that they could not do the work for um, fewer than 30 hours. So that is my understanding. I hope I'm fairly stating it. And, um, you know, as board members, we are observers at these meetings. We're, you know, we're not to basically interfere. This is their um, discussion. And um, I think I've presented yep. the information fairly. The uh, So I don't know what the next steps would be if, the, if we as the board say you have 15 uh, hours of time and money, therefore, uh, what would happen, whether they would, we would negotiate perhaps with ask them to negotiate with a different attorney firm, um, that would be yet to be determined. Yeah, I appreciate that. That's what I figure you guys are there hearing the conversation, so you would know. And then of our attorney, is this pretty common with these kind of committees? Well, I'll, if, I can, if I can just jump in real, real quick before, and, um, you know, this is an oversight committee, and so typically an oversight committee um, you know, the, the district is responsible for, for getting the projects done and for doing the contracts. And then once the, once the, um, once the projects are complete, then the oversight committee looks at that and, and looks at everything. And then they make the determination and give a report out to the public and to the board, whether or not that project was done within the parameters of the, of, of, of what the um, measure said that it was going to do. And so in this case here, um, you know, I wasn't here in 2002. And so, um, you know, I'm unaware of in the middle of a project to, for an oversight committee to then, um, you know, seek out legal counsel. Our previous attorney, Cesar Alvarado, did go to the committee and did explain that um, the no oversight committee, it is not appropriate and that might be the wrong word, but it's not it's not best practice or it's not a common practice for the um, group to um, use an attorney mid project to to review it. And so he went and explained that. 
and um, and then they requested, you know, that that they bring it to an attorney, and we provided um, not our own firms or whatnot, but firms that are that are, you know, just as Trustee Mayo said, but I'm I'm speaking for the district, that firms that specialize in this area, and um, and those firms were were not used or not considered, and then an outside firm that doesn't necessarily just as was was brought up. So so then we offered 15 hours, and this came from our attorney at the time of, of that should be sufficient enough time to research the contract and come back with with a, an opinion for the for the committee. And the committee um, has come back with 30 hours, which which I, I as superintendent, I'm making the right. I don't agree with that. You have 15 hours. It's already outside of the scope of, of what the committee is supposed to be doing. And um, and so we're at this standstill. So I, I think the, the appropriate question to our new attorney, who's only been with us for a month, is what what does 15 hours of service get you compared to 30 hours of service? And maybe we can maybe we can um, you know talk about that without um, having you have to render a decision in something like this. Now, okay. Um, well, so I'll, I'll speak on two things, actually. I mean, it's just attorneys bill by the hour. And so, you know, 15 hours as compared to 30 hours is just going to cost more money. Um, is this a request that CBOX across the state are making? Yes, I am aware that CBOX are making this request. Um, I think that most or I know most school districts believe that it is outside of the scope of the CBOC. The education code outlines seven things that CBOCs are permitted to do. That's education code 715278C and 15280. And within that list, does not it doesn't include expending public funds to hire an independent legal review. Um, are you as board members permitted to use public funds for that purpose, yes. Like, so it's not, I don't believe that it is illegal for you to approve such a request. Um, it's up to you whether or not you you agree that it is within the scope of the CBOX um, purview. Did I answer your question? So the lawyer that has been proposed is saying that they need 30 hours before they've even started. It's not that they started and did 15 hours and then said, I need 15 more. It's that they're asking for a minimum of, of 30, it looks like, in the contract. You are correct. I, I will say that as an attorney, when you get a specific contract, you can typically ask, am I not? Okay, you can typically estimate how long you think something might take you to review, uh, or you should be able to at least. Like, it's going to take me X amount of time. You give me a board policy, for example. I'm going to know approximately how long it's going to take me to do that. So, for what that's worth. Is there a lemma? So, this is $14,000 of public tax dollars that we're being asked to approve. Spending out of our general fund. Essentially, that is that is correct. And it's required to come, um, and we wouldn't want it to come out of Measure J necessarily. But it is uh, not. I think it's important to note that it's not coming out of Measure J funds. Uh, it's coming out of the general fund. Do we know because I was not on the committee last year. Um, do we know if they got similar proposals from any of the lawyers on the list? Uh, or if they only got this one bid, per se? I did not hear information whether multiple firms were consulted or not. That's my memory as well. Okay, so we don't know if there is a, 
a lawyer who may have expertise in this area who may be able to complete this in 15 hours because that's not something that was sought out. Gotcha. We can't make assumptions. <laughs> that's not something that was discussed. I, I don't hearing. think that was shared with us. I don't remember hearing that. Well, I don't think that's making an assumption because you said they were given a list of attorneys that are familiar with this kind and they've opted something else, correct? Did I understand that right? That is correct. Okay. That's my understanding. Thank you. So I guess I'm thinking about like one of the things that CBOC oversees is that uh, our, we as a district have a bidding process for uh, spending public funds. Usually there are multiple, uh, you know, contractors that are um, that are able to bid on a project, and then you you pick the lowest bid, right? So uh, it's interesting to me that that does not appear to be what they've chosen to do in their expending of of these public funds to put it out for multiple lawyers to be able to bid on the project. So the, and then present those to us if they're asking for more than fifteen hours. If there were three, I, I guess I would say because I'm not an ex, I'm not a lawyer who can tell you whether this will take fifteen or thirty hours. It I would feel more comfortable with this if there were three, uh, some of which came from the list that we know have an expertise in this area, and all of them said that it it's going to require thirty hours. That would give me more confidence. It's a little bit difficult for me to take this one law firm that I'm not familiar with, and I don't know if they have the expertise and double the amount of funding that was already approved by the district at this point. I don't know how the rest of you feel. I can agree with you. Oops, sorry. I had the same question I think you brought up is like, it, did the hour, do the hours grow because this firm isn't familiar with this type of work, but we don't know because we have nothing to compare it to. Like, we don't know what the cost was of any of the firms who are very familiar with this type of work. So, yeah, that's what I would have liked to see too. We're all uh, trying to be polite and we're trying to solve this dilemma um, and also be respectful of the work of the committee members, you know, uh, their their conversations and their feelings and their passions around this topic. Um, so um, I, I guess in my mind, based on what you just said, Ms. Cowan, that uh, to our knowledge, there were not three firms that were consulted and a comparison done. I don't know if um, Mr. Vargas knows if there were three firms consulted. Um, and then if um, either we they proceed with this first attorney, this first group, and see what the conclusions are at the first 15 hours, and then come back to the board, or we uh, deny it and then request that staff work with them in identifying a mutually agreeable firm to work with. That could be direction two. So, so I'll confirm at least what I know, that this is the only proposal that we were presented to the district. I don't even think it has to be mutually agreeable. It's more like, what, who are we considering? Um, what, what, what I mean is like, I don't think that's a hurdle we have to get over as much as why not choose, why choose this over that? And why choose someone without experience over anyone of all the plethora of people with experience? So like just coming back with that answer or choosing anyone with experience. I think out of respect, they're trying to assure that the district is not involved, will not be involved, and is completely different, uh, distant from any biased input by the firm. Uh, so, you know, that's one reason. Uh, although if the district currently doesn't have a relationship with any of the firms that were recommended, 
that would appear at least to distance us from um, the work that's being done. But I'm not a member of the committee and uh, you know, they take their role as the watchdogs of, of taxpayer dollars in the Mount Diablo School District very seriously. Yes, and I wanna respect that as well, that I know that they have come forward and said that they were, um, that they were denied the opportunity for legal counsel. But what I'm seeing here is that they were actually approved. It's just that they were approved up to 15 hours and it appears that they've determined that 15 hours is not enough. But again, I think for me, it would be helpful to see from more than one law firm that that is indeed the case. Um, so at this point, I'm not ready to approve this without I, I would like to see them be able to show that they have looked at more than one law firm and that they've looked at the capability of that law firm. Like, is this law firm experienced in this area? And, you know, if they get two other bids, I would say, to be able to show um, how many hours is actually needed, that would give me more confidence that we're spending taxpayer dollars wisely because it's interesting. I mean, I think their goal is aligned with with my goal in this as well is that we want to spend our tax dollars wisely they want to police that like be the watchdog which is their role but then we also need to wisely spend uh money on that role as well right so so i would say at this point i would move to deny this proposal and request that they come back with at least two other proposals to be able to compare it to, to be able to show that we're making the best decision in spending these taxpayer dollars. So that would require, just for clarification, that requirement would be for the first um, amount that was approved by the superintendent. It, well, the, the up to 15 hours was already approved, so I don't think they need to come to us for that. Okay. okay. So it, yes. If they want to advance to 30 hours, then they need to provide um, information for three firms. I think that's reasonable, yes. Would it not just make more sense to not move on it at all and they will come back? They have their representative here. All right, so at this point, I would move to deny this expenditure. No, we don't have to vote no on it. Just not take action on it. Oh, okay. Can I just again, before we, as we, and as we move forward, I just, I want to go back to the original scope of responsibility of, of this committee, that mm -hmm. it is not to uh, render legal opinions or whatnot. It is to, as the committee, to determine whether or not we use the funds appropriately. And if we use them inappropriately, um, and they can determine that as a committee, then then we need to be held accountable for that. But if not, but to you know, it's almost as as if you know we're seeking approval. We're putting the cart before the horse, right? Like the the, the project is underway. It, it's happening. We're doing it. Um, I don't know, you know, where this concern originated. Um, you know, we, we, you know, there were documents floating around that that this board saw that our attorney reviewed and whatnot, and even our own attorney said things are fine with the with the way the with the way the contract was awarded, and and we followed our steps, and so our own attorney gave us that gave us that go ahead, but for some reason this board is saying no we want to we want to dig deeper into this and it's it's outside of the scope of the seven um areas that that we that we previously discussed so so i'm okay going against that i just you know I'm, i just want to voice my my concern about that because what precedent are we setting in, in going forward it's no secret that we want this bond to be successful we, we want this to be successful because if we're going to meet the needs of our of our schools and of our facilities, 
in the future, we're going to have to go out for another bond. And the last thing that we want is, is to not do this correctly. But this does not appear to be the, um, the, the right avenue for, for um, you know, for, for, for what an oversight committee should be doing. So I just, I just want to say that. But we had already said that we would, we would give 15 hours. So I don't want to, I don't want to go back on that. But, um, but I did just want to just voice as, as the, the person responsible in the district here of, um, you know, that this is outside of the scope. But if, 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 if we, if we don't, if we don't take action, then we can see, we can see what comes back. And, and I don't understand what would hurt in talking to a law firm that has experience in this area. Why, why would we not, why would we not look at that? We, we do that. And, and we have relationships with, with lots of, with lots of firms and they wouldn't be legal firms if they're just going to rubber stamp whatever the district says. We bring them in to investigate ourselves. We bring auditors in to audit our books and things like that. So why is this different? So I, I just want to voice that. But we've already we've already said we would we would give the fifteen hours. So I'm not I'm not asking you to, to pull that. But um, so I just wanted to go on record with that. Are we required to take action? That's a question. Because it says because the agenda says action. Yeah, I mean, I. Right, right. All right. So at this point, I feel that, and I will move to deny this expenditure of funds, the fourteen thousand two hundred and fifty. I'll second that. The motion by Trustee Count and the second by Trustee Mason. That motion passes unanimously. Rubio. Okay, so we move on to 17.6. Sorry, we have before you, good evening, uh, item 17.6 for your review and potential approval, total of five board policies and one administrative regulation, uh, but we are asking for your approval of four of those board policies. Three of those are in the 4,000 series that we particularly uh, monitor and coordinate in HR. And uh, one of them is board policy 3312 for contracts revision. And I'm just gonna add to that is that we're we're gonna ask for approval of all of them. Oh, I'm sorry. I was sorry. Okay. Everything listed here. I move. Sorry. <laughs> um, I move um, to approve the changes to board policies and administrative re regulations per California School Board Association recommendations from September 2023 quarterly update. Second. Motion by Trustee Nzewi and second by Trustee Mayo. Thank you, that motion passes unanimously. So that moves us to 17.7, um, review and potential approval of changes to board policies and administrative regulations um, per California School Board Association recommendations, um, December 2023 quarterly update. I just wanna know we're catching up. <laughs> Much appreciated. The next one will be March, March, right? So we're caught up. <laughs> Okay, Madam President, I move to approve the updates to Board Bylaw 9321, closed session, and Exhibits 9321-1 and 9321-2 as presented. 
I'll second that. Motion by Trustee Cam, second by Trustee Mason. That motion, that motion passes unanimously. Um, so we move to um, 17.8. Looks like we maybe have public comment on this one. Um, review and potential approval of the project stabilization um, agreement. Sure, and we're gonna have um, uh, Mr. Vargas speak on it before we do the public comment. Well, real quick. Yeah. Um, so what we have is the project stabilization agreement. So this is the culmination of working with the Trades Council. Um, I don't have a presentation, so I'm open to take any questions, but we we finalized this within the last couple of weeks. Um, but yeah, we 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 look to, to this agreement as being a positive thing for the district and the Trades Council. But again, I'm here to answer any questions that you might have on the agreement. I do have a question. Um, in the regards to the term of the contract, there's an initial five-year um, window, and then there are five two-year subsequent uh, renewals for a total of 15 years. Um, can you explain how that isn't an evergreen contact contract and um, whether or not the district has any other agreements that extend for that period of time? Um, so I'll, I'll do my best. I might have to look to my left, but um, so it, it's not an evergreen because we are we have the initial five year, and then we meet together to discuss the extension of that for another two years. Um, so that makes it not an evergreen. Um, and the examples that that um, we could use is our collective bargaining agreements. So we do those in you know one year, two year, or three year, and then we meet again, and then we extend those beyond whatever we agreed to. Um, so the, the provision in there that makes it not an evergreen is that we are going to discuss it after the first five years. And have the right to say, well, uh, either side has the right to say, I'm cool. Right, or I'm done, sorry. Is that the legal terminology there? Yeah, yeah, but the part I was reading on that was where it says, absent changes or termination, this agreement shall be extended. So that's the only way it would be extended is if those other things didn't happen, yeah. I'm sorry, your voice faded. Oh, so if they did or did not. The, on page 18, article 17, um, so it says absent changes or termination, this agreement shall be extended for the successive two-year terms. Mm -hmm. So to me, that says that there can be changes or termination. So you will have to respect my concern for caution because I know there have been ex situations um, where people forgot about the upcoming date and there was not the review and the discussion and it rolled over without uh, that consultation. And so, therefore, I'm um, cautious about those. Well, That's your caution leads into my comment, which was going to be, I trust that even though it's a five year, we will be reviewing it as a district each year to look at it and see how we feel it's working. So then we can make a good decision at the end of five years if this is something we want to continue or if we want to change it in any way. Correct. Is that accurate? That's accurate. So, so there are systems in place just that um, contracts are So I, I mean, regularly. the the way that I would describe that is because we are, we will be in the process of awarding contracts, you know, utilizing the, the PLA and, you know, we're evaluating that as the work is being done. And every, you know, the districts that are in those kinds of agreements, like we're going to see what isn't working for us. Um, but I think, you know, in the limited interactions that I had with the Trade Council, I want to say it was two meetings. I mean, this is like a working relationship and we're there to work together. Um, and, you know, I'm 
just based off again the conversation um i just don't i think it's very beneficial to both sides to make sure that this works for each of us thank you um should we take public comment okay all right so um we can we have um five public comments on this item i think we can do the full three minutes for each speaker um, and um, we will um, start with Rebecca, Rebecca Barrett. Yeah, push it. Oh, yeah. All right. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, Rebecca Barrett with the Contra Costa Community College District um, and proud Concord High alumni. Um, I hate going first, so um, I will just say um i was really pleased to hear the discussion at the previous meeting and really pleased to see this come back onto the agenda and to even see the discussion again with the board really grappling with this like you should grapple with it um and the district should continue to to look at this too as what was said it's in everyone's best interest to make sure this works so i'm really excited that it's on the agenda um and would ask for would recommend personally and i vote Thank you, Rebecca. Um, Jolene Kramer. Good evening, Superintendent Clark, President McFerrin, and members of the Board of Trustees. My name is Jolene Kramer. Uh, my law firm represents the Contra Costa Building and Construction Trades Council, and in turn, they represent thousands of construction workers here in Contra Costa County. I myself just moved to Concord two weeks ago. So I am, and my husband is a public school teacher in Walnut Creek Elementary School the District. And so I am personally very pleased to be here before you to talk about the passage, hopefully of a project stabilization agreement for your district. I also wanted to extend sincere apologies on behalf of Bill Whitney, the CEO of the Building Trades Council and Tom Hansen, the president, both of them had unavoidable conflicts that prevented them um, from being here today, but they very much wanted to be with you and wanted me to extend their apologies. We had the pleasure of negotiating the PSA with your chief business officer, Adrian Vargas, your director of maintenance and operations, Melanie Coslow, and your outside counsel, Glenn Gould. Once they all came on board, we were able to efficiently negotiate and finalize a fair and beneficial agreement for the district that is focused on providing opportunities for local residents and district graduates. The project stabilization agreement provides them with a path to a secure and stable future, a family sustaining income, high quality health care, and dignity in retirement. Those are the things that the construction trades stand for, and we're excited about working with the district to expand those opportunities here and put lo more local residents and district grads to work on your construction projects. Project stabilization agreements are also an efficiency tool for public agencies, promoting the use of high quality contractors and highly skilled construction workers. They facilitate the completion of public projects on time and on budget, and we feel confident that the district will see those outcomes as well. I believe we reached a model agreement with give and take on both sides that prioritize the, prioritizes the best interests of the school district and the residents of this community, including myself. Thank you again for your time and consideration of the project stabilization agreement, and I'll be available for the remainder of this discussion should you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, Megan Gonzalez. Good evening, uh, on Dallas School Board. My name is Jaime Gonzalez. I'm a senior business rep for Operating Engineers Union Local 3, located here in Concord, and a delegate for the Contra Costa Building Trades. I'm here tonight to uh, ask the board to move forward and approve the project agreement with the Contra Costa Building Trades so that we together can create pay good paying jobs for our community. Thank you. Thank you. Eric Haynes. President McFerrin, Dr. Clark, Council, board members. Uh, my name is Eric Haynes. I'm a business representative with Sheet Metal Workers Local 104, also a delegate to the Contra Costa Building and Construction Trades Council. Um, I myself am a graduate of Mount Diablo Unified School District. My family's been in it since the 50s. 
So for me, this is something monumental to see happen. And I see some skepticism and that's fine. We accept that and appreciate that. But we, I personally have been working on this since 2021. And my predecessor was working on it for two years prior to that. So this isn't something that happened overnight. There was a lot of thought, a lot of debate back and forth to come up with the best agreement we could both have for the Building Trades Council and the school district. Um, we look forward to having a successful project stabilization agreement with this district, with Measure J and with future bonds. So I urge you guys to pass this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Edgar Flores. Uh, my name is Edgar Flores, and I'm a representative of the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades, and I'm also a delegate of the Contra Costa Building Trades, most, most more importantly. And uh, like we was mentioned, we do have, you know, thousands of members that live here in Contra Costa. We have members that live here in Concord and graduates from uh, Mount Diablo, so it would be a good chance for them to work locally, and, uh, you know, they would take pride in working in the school that they went to. Uh, I personally went to Pittsburgh High, and when I got to do the flooring in Pittsburgh High, you take a little more pride. Uh, so... I'll just keep the approval. I mean, hopefully, get the approval for this. Uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so if there are no more questions, we can take a motion on this. All right. Uh, Madam President, I move that the board approve the project stabilization agreement as presented. Second. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I would like to amend the motion by referring to the project stabilization agreement, page three, one point nine, to strike the words or funded in whole or in part from any prospective general obligation bond measure enacted, and to strike one and insert three where spelled out and written numerically. Can you please repeat that? Because I think some of us might have been turning On that page. page okay. three of the project stabilization agreement, number 1.9, to strike the words or funded in whole or in part from any prospective general obligation bond measure enacted, and to strike the word one and insert three were spelled out and written numerically. I'm looking on page three, 1.9. I don't see the word one. Oh, for $1 million, that number, that. So you were saying to. Yes. Ah, I see. So the idea is to amend the agreement, even though it was already negotiated with the group. There has to be a second to my amendment. I'm not seeing a second. Okay, my um, motion has failed or does not move forward. Um, so I'm presuming by uh, the silence that um, all of you are in favor wholly of this measure as presented. Personally, I cannot support encumbering future boards for more than five years. I believe the evidence must be presented publicly or a public evaluation, not just a discussion between the board and um, the council, and the agreement must be presented to the board for subsequent approval. I believe in increasing the threshold provides evidence to our constituents that our board is inclusive, respectful, and strives to provide some measure of equity, not only through our primary purpose, education, but also with our business community and constituents. I also believe that Mount Diablo School District is independently and is independent and is not required to conform 
to the position of other agencies within Contra Costa County. I understand that my viewpoints um, may be not taken well, and um, I wholly support labor. I value your apprenticeship programs, but I also have, have these other beliefs. I believe projects will be successful when everyone involved strives for the highest quality design according to local, state, and federal building codes, plan review, DSA review, the bidding process, the purchasing process, safety on the job, prevailing wages with benefits, course of construction inspections, fairly negotiated change orders, and closeout of all projects. Mount Diablo, Unified School District, the architects, the engineers, the contractors, the inspectors, the reviewers, and the workers are all responsible for the highest quality um, construction projects in our district. The highest quality should be the goal in particular for buildings and all infrastructure that houses our most precious commodity, our youth. So um, I understand that you will be moving forward on the vote. And in the meantime, I'm going to decide how I vote. I express my opinion. Thank you. Okay. May we continue the discussion? Yeah. Um, I would just say uh, thank you for sharing your opinion, uh, Trustee Mayo. Appreciate it. Um, I think from my perspective, one of the things that is challenging for a district um, is uh, to manage all of these projects and also all of the um, state requirements to make sure that the workers that are hired by all of those contractors to make sure that those workers are treated fairly. So one of the things that I look forward to with an agreement like this is that in partnership with our building trades is that um, they become partners who help us to oversee to make sure that all of our workers are treated fairly. So that's one piece. Um, another piece is when we talk about quality work, um, we know that our union partners are all very well trained in how to do the work at the very highest quality. Um, that is harder, I think, for us to assess um, from other contractors who may not have had that type of training and background. Um, for me, the thing that I'm most excited about, about this, um, about this partnership is, um, also the opportunity for apprenticeships for our students. And I think if we raise the threshold, then we are lowering the amount of projects that apply where we can partner on things like the apprenticeships, um, so from the from the agreement itself, I just want to kind of highlight, I think the purpose is to promote the efficiency of construction operations for the district through use of skilled labor, resulting in quality construction outcomes. Um, my understanding is that the um, Contra Costa building and construction trade, trades have a very um, uh, strong track record of um, on time and on budget completion of projects. And over the time that I've been on this board, I have seen a number of our projects come back um, with uh, changes and increased costs and delays. Um, so I'm hoping that um, this type of a partnership will also improve um, the results in, in many ways, both in terms of fair labor, skilled labor, quality outcomes, but also on time and on budget. Um, so those are just some of the things that I'm excited about, about this um, project. I don't disagree with your statements. However, on time and on budget has very many variables. Uh, COVID is an example in that the supply chain did not um, enable us to receive the equipment in a timely time 
amount of time to uh, complete the projects. That's one example. Over uh, the other example for over budget in some instances is that we were unaware of underground utilities or other factors that were not included in the original scope of the work. Therefore, the contract had to be completed. So while your statement is true, I think there's also other statements uh, that are valid that go into uh, projects being delayed and or projects being over the original budget estimate and the agreement. Um, so thank you. Okay, so it seems like we are ready to vote. Um, and the motion was by Trustee Cowan, second by Trustee Insigne. So that motion passes um, for one, um, with one opposed. Just email. Okay. All right. So um, that concludes um, all of our items for this evening. So I am going to adjourn this meeting. Thank you. Yeah, items